Hi guys, it's me Chazzer HD and welcome to this podcast episode where today we're going to be looking at plenty of topics in the world of Formula 1 of course after Singapore and the main topic is how and why did Ferrari win the Singapore Grand Prix? We're going to look at that today and with me as I bring on a moment is Nib. Great to have you all here for the 49th episode. Uh, great to have you along as always for another podcast episode. We're going to be talking about plenty of stuff that I know you guys will be very, very interested in. But as usual, along with me is Nib. And Nib, how are you doing, mate, after the uh, Singapore Grand Prix? I'm uh, I'm doing very well, mate. And uh, how are you doing yourself? Yeah, I'm doing well. Um, are, have you, after the Singapore Grand Prix, you know, have you had a look back? Do you enjoy the race more or not so much after you've seen it? Or have you not seen it yet? Well, I haven't really watched it, but just looking back on the race, I, I certainly enjoyed it more than most Singapore Grand Prix. You know, there was a little bit of controversy, um, some great battling amongst the midfield, which is usually the case at most races so far this season. Um, so I'd probably at the end have to give it a good solid uh, 7 out of 10 or so. It was, it was quite an enjoyable Grand Prix in the end. Yeah, it was. I thought the midfield really made it a you know a great Grand Prix, being as close as they were and being right up there at times, about halfway through the Grand Prix. But yeah, it was a it was a good Singapore Grand Prix compared to other ones, and uh, definitely I think we can say another good Grand Prix in 2019. Of course, this weekend is Russia, but most of what we're going to be talking about is from Singapore or just before that. So, what we're first going to talk about with Ferrari when it comes to how and why. They won the Singapore Grand Prix is the controversy in the race. Now, of course, Charles Leclerc put on pole position. Sebastian Vettel uh, qualified in third. They got away like that for the first 20 laps or so. And then, of course, Sebastian Vettel was brought in by Ferrari for the undercut. I believe he was, um, or not he, but I believe Ferrari were trying to go for the undercut on Lewis Hamilton. But according to Ferrari... They did not expect the undercut to work as much as it did. I can understand why they think that. But again, the undercut around Singapore is probably the most powerful on the entire calendar. So they were always taking that risk, especially with how close the top six were. And then, of course, after Leclerc pitted, Sebastian Vettel then was ahead and they brought home a 1-2 finish. Now... As I said in my race review, and I'll say it again, Ferrari, at the end of the day, had the best strategy for that race because it did go on to secure them a perfect result, a 1-2 finish for the team, their first 1-2 in just over two years. So people may criticise it in terms of how it's unfair for Charles Leclerc. And in terms of Charles Leclerc, the driver, yeah, it is unfair. We get that. But again, both drivers are not competing for the driver's title. So at the end of the day, when it comes to the individuality of the drivers and what they're fighting for, it doesn't really matter because they're not fighting for anything. So from a team perspective, which is the only way you can look at it, it was a great decision. And I don't really think they needed to swap around the drivers because there was no point doing that around Singapore, where if you do that, you might be at risk of letting another car through like Max Verstappen. So I think what Ferrari did was absolutely fine. And, you know, they got the 1-2 and they're coming away smiling as ever. Nib, um, when it comes to this, I guess, controversy, but it wasn't that controversial. Um, when it comes to Ferrari, do you think they were right in what they did? I think they were, but do you think they were right in what they did at the end of the day? And for Charles Leclerc, we can understand, can't we, why he's frustrated. But as he said after the race... Once he looked at the situation and saw why it happened, he accepted it. Do you think that was, you know, sensible by Leclerc? Do you think you can, you know, understand how he was feeling during the race? And yeah, what did you think of the whole thing? Well, yeah, absolutely. Because as the lead driver, you expected to be uh, pitted first. You know, that's just that's just sort of an accepted thing in the world of uh, Formula One that the driver at the team who is leading usually gets the first pit stop, but we've seen even as recent as Spa that they've pitted um, the second driver at Ferrari first instead of the first driver um, with track on track position. And this time um, 
Sebastian, the t- they didn't Ferrari didn't struggle with their tyres as much, say, as what they did at Spa. So Leclerc was basically allowed to get past at Spa, but because there wasn't really any issue and also there was traffic, I think that if there wasn't the traffic of Giovinazzi, Ricardo, Stroll, or them, what that maybe they might have swapped them around, but because the traffic and then Sebastian built up a gap, I think it was about six seconds, there was never going to be any chance or any way that Ferrari were going to let Shell through, uh, which ultimately is the correct decision. Um, and honestly, I don't think Ferrari intentionally did mean to do this whatsoever. Um, they're trying to undercut Hamilton, but certainly I don't think they tried to get to get Vettel past Leclerc. Um, Vettel gained a gigantic amount of lap time on his uh, outlap, and that's what put him ahead of Leclerc. I don't think they expected the, the, his pace to be that good, um, but it wasn't. It was just sort of an un- unintended consequence of um, actually Ferrari's rather good strategy because it took um, Mercedes a little bit by surprise, got them way out ahead of Hamilton, and then obviously Vettel ahead of Leclerc. So in the end of the day, a fantastic strategy for for Ferrari. Maybe not so um, for Charles Leclerc, but it's not like he's going for a world championship. Ferrari are trying to get the most points they can. And they're arguably what was going into this race, one of the weakest circuits on the calendar, they've got a one too. So at the end of the day, you have to just credit the, uh, the strategy of Ferrari. Absolutely. And I cannot say it's so weird to be saying that Ferrari on strategy are actually doing really well at the moment. They're actually consistently for the last four or five races doing well in this area. So good to see that they're starting to get some consistency in a good way on that um, area when it comes to the team track side. But as you say, you know, Ferrari got the one two and considering that coming into that weekend or um, or the you know the weekend we just had, they were not expecting to be anywhere near the race victory. So they were not going to even give Red Bull or Mercedes a hope by letting Leclerc get past Sebastian Vettel. But talking of Mercedes, of course, their race also came down in terms of their race result to the strategy, with Lewis Hamilton being left out so long by Mercedes in a strategy that was more so hopeful than actual, you know, tactical, because even Lewis Hamilton came out and said after the race, and I even said it in the build-up to the race watch-along, that Lewis Hamilton, the way he was going to win the race is by undercutting past Charles Leclerc. And even Lewis Hamilton after the race said that they discussed that, and that was probably the way they were going to go, but they just decided to not bother and it was so surprising that they decided to do that. And of course, that's why they ended up P4 and P5. Also, uh, Valtteri Bottas was told by James Vowles with the famous Valtteri, this is James, to uh, drop off and leave a gap for Lewis to drop into. Now, people have been criticising this, and I completely understand why. But I actually, after looking back at the race and looking at how it unfolded, it actually does make a lot of sense, and here's why. The reason they wanted Lewis to come out ahead of Valtteri is because Lewis would have had a lot fresher tyres, and Lewis this, uh, not this weekend, but last weekend at Singapore, was a lot faster in that car around that track. So they knew they had messed up, but they were trying to give themselves the best opportunity possible to fight back against Verstappen, Leclerc and Vettel. And even though... They didn't actually get past, you know, Verstappen, Leclerc, Vettel. They had to try after the mistake they made to try and go and get a podium or even more. So I think at the end of the day, it is understandable why they told Valtteri to do that. Again, I completely understand why people are angry. But if you actually look at, I think, why they did it, it does make a lot of sense. And Nib, um, yeah, for Mercedes, were you as surprised as I was, and I think you were, in the race watch along as to why they didn't decide to undercut past Charles Leclerc? Um, a little bit, but we've seen from the last couple of races that Ferrari have actually taken Mercedes a little bit by surprise by pitting earlier. Um, but I think that one thing that also might have played into it is Mercedes might not have known how much time they would have gained from the undercut. Because you've seen towards the end um, of the uh, of the first stint, well, certainly a couple of laps before the pit stop started, Leclerc actually had a pretty solid gap over Hamilton. But 
as I think our Vettel and all of that pitted, uh, the gap was actually pretty close. So if they had pitted on that same lap that Vettel did, um, I think pretty comfortably Lewis Hamilton would have won the Grand Prix. And, you know, this is the sort of fine margins which which determine um, which driver is going to win the race at, at tracks where you pretty much can't overtake um, if you're in a top car. So it, it's just little decisions like that. But, yeah, not, not a fan of Valtteri Bottas doing a, a 145 and then uh, being told to do a 148. Yeah, I, I like it, that just doesn't sound good. And Toto Wolf said that as well. I understand, you know, sort of why they've they done it, but, you know, Bottas is still in the championship and then to be told to slow down to let Hamilton in front, I, I'm I'm not a particularly a fan of that at, at all. I can understand why, and I think maybe they didn't have to make it so public, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think Mercedes have already counted Valtteri out of the Drivers' Championship hunt themselves, and I think, you know, we have anyway... And that's why also another reason why they did it, because they, I think, in the team know, even though they won't t uh, tell it to Valtteri, that Valtteri is not contending with Lewis Hamilton for the driver's title. So they were like, right, you know, we're going to be P4 and P5 once everyone pits. Let's try and, you know, mix things up. But yeah, I can understand why you didn't quite like him then dropping, what, three and a half seconds off of what he was doing. Um, but also another thing, Lewis Hamilton uh, said after the race, and I've actually thought this in the last couple races and even before that, is he said that Mercedes are not as hungry as Ferrari. Now, this comes to a point of Mercedes, you know, in the first eight or nine races, Mercedes were the best team in Formula One in almost every area because they were very hungry. They were going out there and getting the best result they possibly could almost every single time. But ever since Austria, where, and, you know, that was the first race they didn't win, ever since that race, they've not been that good. I mean, Austria, they weren't quick. Silverstone, they dominated. Hockenheim was a mess. Hungary, they just about got the victory after brilliant strategy and driving. And then in the last three races, they just haven't quite got it all together to get the victory. And I think Lewis is right. Mercedes, after dominating the first eight or nine races, because they had both um, championships basically wrapped up, I think he is right. I don't think Mercedes are particularly hungry at the moment. Um, Nib, do you agree with that? And... Do you think, because Mercedes know, of course, they're going to win the constructors and drivers, do you think because them being a bit more relaxed, do you think they'll let, you know, Ferrari and Red Bull have a bit more of, of an opportunity? Um, Perhaps, but I don't, I think that Hamilton is more saying this to motivate the team than anything, you know, to try and work harder because we've seen that Ferrari have brought upgrades to um the Singapore Grand Prix, which has put them ahead of, Mercedes, at least for the Singapore Grand Prix, um, with these new aero pack, um, new era updates that they brought. So maybe it's Hamilton just saying, you know, come on, we can't switch off. Ferrari is still here, even if they looked miles off the race win a couple of um, well, a couple of months ago. Of course, they were always going to be pretty strong at Monza and and uh, and at Spa. But to win in Singapore, I don't think anyone expected it. And I think it's taken Mercedes by surprise and Hamilton by surprise. And that's why Lewis is saying that just to keep motivating um, everyone back at um, back at the factory, you know, to keep going strong. You know, Ferrari are here. Even if they don't look like they're going to win a race, they still can. You know, we re if we want to keep our, our stronghold on, our, on the sport, we really still have to be working at our hardest no matter what. So I, I think that... Hamilton is just um, just using that kind of to try and motivate everyone at Brackley. Yeah, and hopefully from their point of view it does because they have kind of dropped off and even at times they were slower um, at the end of their tyre stints than some of the midfield runners because they weren't really that quick. And talking of, you know, the midfield runners being at times quicker than the top teams and that really did allow for the midfield to possibly or it actually did allow them you know to race the top teams we have had 
the suggestion in the last, I think, few weeks of possible reverse grid qualifying races um, that might be tested for 2020, then might be brought out fully, I don't know, in 2021 or something like that. Now, in Singapore, we did have a situation where some of the midfield runners were, you know, who had not pitted yet, were actually holding up the, the top runners, and that was creating racing between the midfield and the top teams. Now, yes, it was good, but qualifying has to be left alone. We do not need qualifying races. Qualifying is absolutely fine, and it's been fine since this Q1, Q2, Q3 system has been introduced in 2006. There is no reason to do qualifying races because, you know, if it's not really going to affect the race on the Sunday, then what is the point in doing it? Because at the end of the day, qualifying is important to the end product, the show on the Sunday, because qualifying, of course, sets the grid for Sunday. And sometimes qualifying can be better and more exciting and still exciting even if the race is better. Um, you know, during the weekend, I just don't understand why Liberty want to do qualifying races. They claim that, you know, they listen to the fans. But after looking at social media, almost every person I have seen has said, don't do qualifying races qualifying is not broke the system we use at the moment do not fix it so if they really do listen to the fans and they want you know the fans feedback as to how the racing should improve for us entertainment wise qualifying races is not the way forward it's not the way forward because it's not going to i think make things better it's not going to you know this is not Formula E, by the way. This is not Formula E. We're not going down this road of tons of gimmicks just to throw useless, you know, pointless entertainment in there. You've got to try and allow Formula 1 to be as authentic and, you know, less gimmicky as possible. And they're not going to do that if they allow qualifying races. Now, you may say that the F2 system of, you know, letting the people who are normally quick start a bit lower down, come through the field is good. But Formula 2 is not responsible for millions of fans' entertainment. And Formula 2 would be exciting anyway, even if they didn't do a reversed um, top 8. So, reverse grid races for qualifying, I'm sorry, it's not a good idea. And if Liberty actually want to listen to the fans like they claim to do, then they will not introduce this. Because I'm telling you, it's not going to work. It is not going to work. And it is a terrible idea. Nib, do you agree or do you want to see qualifying races in the future? Um, I, I think that they could potentially make changes to qualifying. Um, but qualifying races and reverse grid orders, absolutely categorically not a fan of whatsoever. You know, we've we've seen this in 2016 or whenever it is that the shambles um the of the new qualifying system that stayed for what was it three races um absolute shambles we we don't want a repeat of that and the fact that um all the teams are signed off on it apparently is um is quite ridiculous um you know i i'm, I'm willing to give it a try but we don't need to change qualifying qualifying's great it's qualifying as as a spectator is one of the best things the weekend and you know instead of creating like a false, um, you know, sort of battling between the midfield and the top teams, how about you actually close the amount of money that they can spend, you know, of course, have the budget cap, and then the teams will be closer because this weekend at Singapore, I think was a prime example of what we should be aiming for, that there wasn't much of a gap in, in race pace between the top and the midfield teams. And then, and then when the top teams had to pit, that they actually come out behind the midfield runners because usually for every single race, they build that gap to the midfield and then they pit and it's just a bit boring. You know, they have clean air. There's not much potential for undercut or for an overcut um, or, you know, vice versa. Um, and, and that's, that is much better when there's actually midfield runners. They're actually fighting for proper position when they haven't pitted. And that, I think that's what we should be aiming for, for closer racing, not for, 
you know, falsified, um, you know, f- for fake, basically, racing. Um, that's what we should be aiming for, what we had at Singapore this weekend, and not manufactured um, racing, which what which is what we'd have um, if we had sort of reversed grids or a new silly qualifying system. Yeah, I, I agree. And look, one of the main reasons why many people out there and myself don't like a sport like a Formula E is because it's too fake in terms of the rules that try to create more exciting racing. If you really look at the more simple stuff like on the cars or as Nib said when it comes to the budgets that the teams or manufacturers are allowed to use, if you fiddle around with those things, that will probably help a lot more in terms of the show than creating a gimmick. So, as Nib said, you know, if they lower the top team's budgets and make it a bit closer so the midfield can compete, then you will get, when the top teams pit, maybe a bit of midfield versus top team racing, and then the gap can close over time. But qualifying races, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not a good idea. And again, if they actually, as they claim, listen to the fans, and they will not go through with this idea. But... You know, one of the things that they do want with it is a bit of action and a bit of chaos. And when it comes to chaos, of course, this man on screen, Roman Grosjean, was really at the front of it um, in Singapore. But there was big news, of course, with Roman Grosjean um, before the Singapore Grand Prix. I didn't really, or we didn't really get to talk about it much. So that's what we're going to talk about now. And also the Kubica news. But Grosjean, of course, is staying at Haas for 2020. Now, again, I disagree with this move. Roman Grosjean should not be at Haas. And I really doubt he should be in Formula 1 anymore. Because even though I was a bit of a fan of him two or three years ago when he was actually a good driver and, you know, consistently with what he had was doing well. At the moment, he's not as good as he was. And he's not good enough for Formula 1, in my opinion, anymore. Um, If you look at this season, yes, there has been races where he has been on the pace and been a good competitor, but there's been other races where, I'm sorry, he's been simply terrible and very poor for the standards that Haas have set. So how Grosjean is on the grid for next season and potentially Hulkenberg is not, I cannot believe... And this is coming from a person that doesn't rate Nico Hülkenberg that much at all. But I can tell you for sure that Nico Hülkenberg does deserve to be on the Formula 1 grid right now ahead of Romain Grosjean. And I just can't believe Haas have made this decision because if they want to improve for 2020, I just don't see how keeping Romain on is a good idea because... If you look at also 2018, Roman has cost the team a lot of points and a lot of opportunities in the last two years. If they had Hülkenberg in the Haas, for example, of 2018, I think Haas finished P4 in the Constructors. And maybe that leads to a better 2019. But, you know, keeping Roman on again, it's just going to end up in Haas having, again opportunities to do stuff but Roman will time and time again cock it up and will mess up any opportunity the team comes across to get a great result because that is what he has done most of the time in the last couple years. Nib, um, how surprised were you at this news because I just couldn't believe that they kept on Roman Grosjean. Well I've got I've got three questions. What? Why? Huh? <laughs> like what? I, I I I absolutely do not understand why Roman Grosjean has been signed on by Haas uh, for 2020. Um, I thought that he maybe could have been gone, you know, last season even because of course he didn't even have any points up until Austria. I think he was he was that bad, and we know how good Haas were in the first half of of 2018. You know, Magnussen had a whole heap of points, and if he actually had scored some Christ and points. I don't, I didn't know what other used to what other word to use then. Sorry, um. But <laughs> if he had scored some points, 
they would have been a very strong position to get P4. And we've seen that Nico Hulkenberg got some fantastic results in the Renault, which eventually got them P4 on the constructors. But no, um, Haas, I don't know what they're smoking, have decided to keep Romain Grosjean. Um, and I'm certainly not going to be looking forward to keeping to hearing his whining um, voice of blaming other people um, for, for other inc- incidences uh, like the other day in Singapore, which was absolutely ridiculous. Um, I I just I just don't know what what Haas are really thinking. You know, does does Grosjean have some pictures of Gene Haas or something? <laughs> You're like, come on, what? Uh... no, just just I I ha- I have no actual. I do not understand in the slightest why they have kept Roman Grosjean at all. I don't understand. There are a, there are a list of drivers who are better than Roman Grosjean. I think I think most of us could agree that Pascal Verlein would be a better choice than Roman Grosjean at the yeah. moment. Um, there's there's prop Nick De Vries. Um, there's a whole bunch of other drivers, and now it looks like that Hulkenberg isn't going to have a seat in Formula One, which is an absolute uh, joke. You know, Hulkenberg is, is is absolutely worthy of a midfield seat. And to think that his two choices at the moment are Alfa Romeo, which probably won't happen because they're going to keep Giovinazzi, or Williams, which probably isn't going to happen because they're probably going to put Latifi in the car, as we're going to touch on in a moment. So it's an absolute joke that Hulkenberg is, um, is going to be out of a seat. Of course, maybe he doesn't... Um, you know, perhaps the correct decision by uh, Renault to, to get Ocon in the car, you know, I understand that. But for Hulkenberg to potentially not be on the grid and Roman Grosjean is ridiculous. Roman, do us all a favour. Go write some more cookbooks. <laughs> yeah, um, well, he should uh, get practising the uh, the cooking and all that stuff again because I don't really think if he continues the form he's had in the last couple of years, I don't see how Roman stays on the grid past 2020, but I said that for um, for, for 2020. I said, I don't understand how Roman can continue after 2019, and he is going to. So, no idea. I don't know what he has on, um, as you said, Gene Haas or Gunter Steiner. I, I don't know what he has, but it must have been good for him to keep that seat. Um, and then, as you said with Williams, of course, Robert Kubica is gone. We knew he was going to be gone. He's been terrible. Let's be honest, guys. He's been terrible. Um, and yeah, do you think it'll be Latifi? I think it'll be Latifi because he's got the money. He's quicker than Kubica. And he is the reserve driver. And he knows the team well, doesn't he? Oh, uh, well, yeah. You know, and even though Kubica's got one point and Russell has zero, it's 15-0 in qualifying. <laughs> you know, he he's he's lit. Russell is Alonso. Kubica is Van Dorn. Or even worse. Um. It, it's it's a bit of a joke how 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 poor Robert Kubitz has been. You know, of course, fantastic to see him back, but he just hasn't been up to the standard which Williams or the sport requires. So, yeah, um, obviously glad that this sort of happened, that um uh, that Kubitz got his chance to come back after that horrible rally incident which he had uh, at the end of 2010, the start of 2011. Um, which of course robbed him of his seat at Renault for that season, and I think they put Vitaly Petrov in the car um, along with Nick Heidfeld. Was it in the Renault then? That that, that was a long, long time ago. Um, but yeah, I think that they probably will put Latifi in there, as you've said. Um, you know, of course, already the reserve driver, the third driver, and he's had a pretty solid season so far in. Uh, in Formula 2, of course, the, the other better driver really in Formula 2 this season, Nick DeVries, has, has signed on to a Formula E team. So, of course, you know, it, it, it should be Latifi. And then if it's not Nicholas Latifi, I'll be uh, majorly surprised. Yeah, it's going to be Latifi. And also, he's doing well in F2. So, I don't see why they wouldn't put him in the car. And when Claire Williams was asked about... You know, possible drivers. The only name she herself brought up without being prompted was Nicholas Satifi. So I think that pretty much says that he is the favourite because they didn't even ask her about Latifi, I don't believe. Uh, they asked her about Hulkenberg, but she didn't really offer anything on that. So it's probably going to be Latifi. Um, yeah, maybe there are better drivers out there who Williams should go for, or, well, they are definitely better drivers such as Hulkenberg, but 
I don't think that is going to happen. But it's now time, guys, to get on to the second part of why or how Ferrari won in Singapore. And we're going to do a tech update, not only for Ferrari, but also for uh, Racing Point, Alpha and Renault, I believe. So, Nib, I'll let you take this away and take us through the new updates for the cars. Yeah, well, let's get right into it with uh, the upgrades which Ferrari brought to the Singapore Grand Prix. And uh, their team boss, Mattia Bonotto, said that after the Hungarian Grand Prix, uh, they worked really hard to get these upgrades for Singapore. They're actually going to come later in the season. But um, Ferrari is certainly very happy that they did come for the Singapore Grand Prix. And first looking here, they ha they brought a new um, front wing, not, not actually to do with the front wing, but to do with that little cape just um, just off the side of the main nose cone. Previously, Ferrari had um, the McLaren-style cuts and little circles to create vortices through the um, through the rear wing, but they put that little cape and those and that little black. Um, see how you got that little black um, piece of carbon fiber there, where the nostrils of the of the of the uh, nose cone are. That that is just using those. That's being used to direct the air underneath the car and also the edges of the little cape um, just off the side of the nose cone being used to also create vortices and obviously for I've seen that this has worked um, well for them um, on the numbers and it certainly did work very well because when they wanted to um, put more front downforce in the car over the weekend um, it certainly worked for them and they were able to create a lot more front downforce because that's something that they've struggled with so much this season is that they were struggling so much with understeer through a lot of the corners. And if you watched Charles Leclerc's um, lap, you could see that he could be a lot more aggressive into the corners um, than what he was able to do. And uh, we also do have a couple of other shots of the uh, of the front wing there. And we will move on to a comparison from the old, old uh, front wing to the new one just after we cover the new floor, which Ferrari brought for this weekend. And as you can see here, They've brought these this um this little upgrade, which has actually turned out to be very very crucial, um and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, as you can see, they've got these little um parts of carbon fiber, which are just deflectors to deflect, um the sort of dirty air um to to attach it to those little slits and get it underneath um the floor to attach it and then along to the diffuser, but also to to guide air away from the rear tire and towards, well, outside of the rear tyres, so it doesn't overheat the rear tyres. But now just onto this last little picture of the rear wing, just these little um, these little pieces of bodywork just in front of the rear tyre, these are so, so crucial for Ferrari. They've been struggling with overheating of the rear tyres all season long, and we've seen the track at Singapore where there's 23 corners that they actually kept their tyres in the window the entire time. So... That that little upgrade there for Ferrari just in front of the um in the rear tire was so so crucial and a major factor as to why they won the Singapore Grand Prix. As we've seen, they had fantastic race pace and were actually um quite a bit quicker um than Mercedes and even Red Bull during the race. But yes, as we can see now, this is the new front wing where it's got Charles Leclerc um at the front of the garage. And then just moving over to the next uh, next picture where it's got Seb. That is the old front wing. And you can see how it's got those cuts um, along the side the, of the nose cone. Um, the, the old McLaren style sort of front wing design. But now they've gone for a new design, um, which we've seen a couple of teams run so far this season. And it certainly has worked out very well for the scooter out and now next on to alfa romeo who brought actually quite a few upgrades um for the singapore grand prix as they brought a new mirror as we've seen very similar to what red bull brought um at the at the uh, belgium grand prix it was so good to see that they also brought some upgrades there and then on to um the front side of the alfa romeo they brought some upgrades uh just to the turning veins um on the front nose cone as you can see, they're just um, just closest to the image. Um, those little slits are actually quite new because we see a lot of teams run capes, but having slits um, in the capes is quite unusual. So just they um, wanted to create some more vortices um, or vortexes um, 
before they hit these turning veins, which are a little bit further back. So actually quite a neat upgrade by Alfa Romeo there. And we've seen that uh, they're actually pretty sold at, at Singapore, which um, perhaps I did not expect. And there is another shot of those turning veins there. But now on to the rear wing of the Alfa Romeo. And as you can see, well, you might not be able to see, they brought some new upgrades for their rear wing as well. They brought some um, added um, rear end plates here, which are better displayed in this rear on shot, or sorry, the side on shot of the rear wing. Um, just those little black piece, pieces of carbon fiber. Those are new upgrades for the Alfa Romeo team. And uh, just quickly on to... Uh, no, we don't we don't have it. Oh yes, just quite quickly onto um onto their rear wing from Monza. Um and I think you might say that um that they have quite a bit of a uh, a different rear wing for Singapore. So uh just look at how skinny the rear wing is for uh for Monza and then compare it to Singapore. That is the difference between a low downforce rear wing and a high downforce rear wing, and I will also display that with uh with Renault. Um, just after we get some upgrades, which were brought to us by um, Racing Point. And first of all, we move on to the front wing. And as you can see, um, see how they're running the old sort of Ferrari style, um, you know, little cuts in the just in the front bit of the side nose cone to create those vortices as the, that McLaren idea from quite some time ago now. I think it was 2015. Where they, de where they debuted that so quite so quite some time ago now. But uh, the main upgrade for Racing Point here, the completion of their upgrade package, which started at um, Hockenheim, which then they brought upgrades at Spa, and which has finally ended here at Singapore. It was all mainly to do with the end plates, and very interesting um, end plate upgrade here. They've got quite a lot of the end plate cut out towards the rear, rear hand side, and... Yeah, that's that's just to create a lot more downforce, a lot more vertices just along that leading edge where the air first makes contact um, with that end plate. And then they've probably got a cutout. So then it, the vortices carry underneath the car, attach to the bodywork down towards the barge boards to create more downforce. Because if they, if they didn't think that this would work, they wouldn't have brought this upgrade. So very nice little upgrade there for racing point. And then also they brought a new rear wing um, as you can see, just where the um, just where the white paint is, uh, that is new. How it's curved up so much. A pretty interesting upgrade there. And they also did add some end plate um, work there. And now finally, just on to uh, I think the best uh, the best example of uh, a low downforce rear wing compared to a high downforce rear wing. As you can see on screen at the moment, the uh, the the low downforce, the skinny wing of the of the Red F1 team, which they were racing with at Monza, and then we've got the high downforce rear wing, uh, which was which was raced with at Singapore. So quite a little bit more rear wing there, that's for sure. And of course, when we go from um, such a low downforce circuit at Monza to such a high downforce circuit at Singapore. You see them chuck all the downforce back on because you need all the downforce possible around the 23 corners of Singapore. And yeah, it's it's always um, nice to see these comparisons. And also with the, um, with the brake ducts, um, you know, Singapore is notoriously tough on the brakes and you see teams um, run quite a bit uh, larger brake ducts just so that they don't have issues because we've seen um, in the past, I believe most famously Mark Webber in 2009, um, his brakes failed at Singapore and retired him from the Grand Prix. So there's quite actual, quite a few upgrades here from the Singapore Grand Prix, um, which was nice to see because I was a bit worried that we might not be getting any upgrades for the Singapore Grand Prix. So let's see if there's any upgrades for the uh, for the next upcoming races. And if there is, of course, we will bring them to you. So, um, of course, Ferrari, those upgrades certainly have worked very well for them when they wanted to put more downforce on the front of the car. They still had the control of the rear end with these little upgrades that they had to the fore. They were able to keep the rear tire in check whilst adding the downforce to the front of the car. The car had some balance for the first time in some time, and Ferrari were very happy with that. And, of course, it brought pole position for Charles Leclerc, which I don't think anyone expected, and even more unexpectedly, a 1-2 for them in the race. So great, great job there by the 
by the guys at Marinello to bring this upgrade in time for the Singapore Grand Prix. And uh, it certainly worked out pretty handedly for them. Absolutely. And thanks, Nib, for doing that. And yeah, that Ferrari upgrade is probably the biggest upgrade by any team this season in terms of um, changing the complexion of the grid in, you know, whatever fight that certain team is in. Because, you know, going into Russia and Suzuka, I thought Ferrari wouldn't be too bad in qualifying before Singapore and the upgrades they brought. But after Singapore and the performance they've gained at Russia and Suzuka, you have to say, if it stays dry, I think Ferrari are absolutely the favourites in Russia to win. Maybe Suzuka as well and definitely tracks like Brazil as well. So it really has worked for Ferrari and it definitely does. If Ferrari can maintain that going forward into 2020, it makes me very excited for 2020. But before we go, of course, we need to quickly cover uh, Russia. And of course, that's the Grand Prix this weekend now. When it comes to what I think, I'll give my thoughts on that on Thursday because that's when I'm going to be doing my Russian Grand Prix preview. Thursday, 12 p.m. UK time is when that will be uploaded. Uh, so, Nib, for this weekend's race, uh, quickly for the pecking order, what do you think it will be and how do you think certain teams will do? Well, I think um, I think after Ferrari's performance at Singapore, it's pretty hard not to say that they're going to be good at, at Russia. You know, Russia is... is in a, in a way, a little bit similar to Singapore. There's quite a lot of 90-degree corners, which Ferrari were notoriously horrible in. And, um, of course, quite a lot of low-speed corners, which um, Ferrari were obviously horrific in um, earlier on the season. But now, with these upgrades, they're actually in some of the slow and mid-speed corners faster than Mercedes. So I think they really do have a strong chance at Russia. And I think quite possibly... Um, they, they could win the, the Russian Grand Prix. So that is what I'm going to predict. I think that Ferrari will uh, will have the edge um, this weekend at, at Russia. Uh, it's going to be close, uh, perhaps maybe not in qualifying, because, of course, there are long, big straights in Russia, of course, um, in the first sector and in the second sector. So I think that that will, will play into Ferrari's hands um, quite a lot. Um, but I still think that... So probably Ferrari... Uh, gonna win the Grand Prix. I think that um, the Red Bull and Mercedes will just be a little bit behind them, but I think their main challenges will be um, will be Mercedes, if I'm perfectly honest. But then at the top of the midfield, I think Renault actually have a very good chance. Um, perhaps if they don't run over some curbs, um, you know, <laughs> of get, getting a very strong result, because we've seen in in Singapore they did probably have. Um, the fastest car, or was certainly a lot closer to McLaren than what they were, say, pre-Spa. So that that's hopeful and, and perhaps good news for Renault. Uh, of course, Renault and McLaren are probably going to be the two best midfield teams. Um, then Alfa Romeo did seem pretty strong, even with Antonio Giovinazzi, who credit to him, did have a very good Singapore Grand Prix. I think Alfa Romeo are going to be pretty strong there as well. But then I still think lagging behind the rest of the midfield are going to be Toro Rosso and Racing Point, even with these upgrades which Racing Point have, be, have brought. But who knows? I think that they will be probably a bit stronger at Russia than what they were um, in Singapore, just because, well, the better at um, lower down four circuits. We've seen that in the past. And uh, I think that we will uh, probably see that again. And then, of course, Haas, actually credit to them. I thought that um, Kevin Magnussen drove a very good Grand Prix in Singapore. It's just that the safety cars and, of course, the sandwich bag um, getting caught in his front wing sort of ruined his race. So unfortunate for Kevin Magnussen, but I think that um, Haas will, will be out of the points. And then, of course, Williams, uh, with George Russell out qualifying Robert Kubica for the 16th time, or 17th time, whatever it is now, uh, will be at the back of the grid. So those are my predictions um, early on for the pecking order for the for the Russian Grand Prix. As I said, hard to kind of go against Ferrari at the moment after what they served up in Singapore, but who knows? It is a mad sport. We could see Mercedes back on top, or even Verstappen and, and Red Bull back on top. So... I'm certainly looking forward to the Russian Grand Prix. It's going to be an extremely intriguing weekend to see if these upgrades by Ferrari have actually well and truly worked. Absolutely, and I understand why you think Ferrari are going to be very hard to beat. And, uh, well, yeah, I think that is probably going to be the case. But, guys, that is it for the 49th episode of the podcast. Thank you guys for coming along and being part of the podcast and, you know, interacting with us, as I'm sure you're doing in the comments. Nib, 
Uh, thanks for coming along and offering your thoughts on you know stuff from Singapore and other stuff and also giving your analysis of the new tech pieces. Great to have you along, of course. And uh, yeah, we'll see you on Sunday for the uh, race watch along for the Russian Grand Prix. Yeah, of course. Very, uh, I'm very glad that I'm here for the uh, for the podcast. And um, indeed, certainly looking forward to the Russian Grand Prix on Sunday. And of course, we'll see you all, all you guys then. So until then, I hope you have a have a good week, and uh, we'll see you later. Absolutely. And I just want to, before I get to plugging my social medias and stuff like that, just want to remind you guys again, the next two videos coming up on the channel before we get to the Russian Grand Prix. This time tomorrow, uh, if you're watching this video as soon as it has come out, at 12pm UK time on Wednesday, I'll be uploading an F1 driver ratings video for the Singapore Grand Prix, along with um, another person who's going to be appearing in that video as a collaboration, a smaller YouTuber in the F1 world. Um, who will be giving you know his thoughts on the drivers and how they did in Singapore. Then on Thursday, again, 12 p.m. UK time, I'll be doing my Russian Grand Prix preview and be giving my predictions for qualifying in the race. And then I will be live at 12.30 p.m. UK time on Friday for Practice 2 in Russia for the Practice 2 watch along. I'll be live then at 12 p.m. UK time on Saturday for the qualifying watch along. And then shortly after, of course, will be the review of qualifying. And then me and Nib will be live at 10 past 11 a.m. UK time. But of course, the race watch along for the uh, 2019 Russian Grand Prix. The race, of course, starting an hour later. So don't forget to join us for that content coming up this week. And if you don't want to miss out, then don't forget to subscribe. Bottom right of the screen, you can do it right there. Or go to my homepage, subscribe, and hit the notifications bell. Also, don't forget to like this video, comment down below what you thought of this video, and comment down below what you thought of what we've had to say. And, um, yeah, just let us know what you think of what we have said. Don't forget to join our Discord, link below in the, in the, um, in the description. That is the best place for notifications, my videos, and streams. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Chaz6110. Don't forget to like my Facebook. At, um, it's ChazRHDF1 on Facebook. And as well, don't forget to follow me on my website, ChazRHD.com, for more content like this. But guys, until my next video coming up tomorrow, and of course the Russian Grand Prix, and the next podcast episode in hopefully a week and a half's time, it has been me, ChazRHD. Goodbye.